Michael. So, so, so what? Initially, you yep. you were you'd have uh, clients who would come to you and say, Michael, I need some drumming. Can you record the drums? And while you're at it, can you mix the record for me? Is that sort of the vibe? Yeah, well, it kind of started off uh, as a little humble kind of garage studio that I kicked my father's car out and decked out the garage. Um, and, you know, um, because I was, I grew up in the 80s, I understood how to program. I, you know, I was a drummer, um, you know, so I was all over drums, like recording both drums and drum machines, programming. Um, I always played keys. I always played guitar. Um, you know, it sort of made it easy for me because in those days, as you could appreciate, everything was done in a studio. There was no home studios in those days. No little MacBook Pros with um, garage bands. So, you know, so pretty much it took off, you know, straight away. I was quite lucky in that sense. So, yeah, as you said, um, you know, I picked up bits and pieces, recording drums, doing small mix downs, doing demos. And then it kind of grew from there, Pete. So I bought some decent gear. Um, my father spotted me, at, I think in those days, about 25, 30 grand. And he said, if you want to make money, you've got to wake up in the morning and answer your phone. So I woke up in the morning, answered my phone, and here we go. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. That's terrific. Because yeah, um, I started with my brother uh, in, what, 95, working in, at Woodstock as the assistant. Absolutely. And, uh, and I got to work with some great Australian acts and some international acts. But um, that was hard work for me because uh, I, I just know how uh, difficult it was for us as a, a recording studio to um, compete with the bigger studios and, and try to grab those clients that can make you money. Now, I didn't come from a, like, I didn't play music. I mean, I, I sang a little bit in the band once upon a time, but that was as far as it went. And I sort of yeah. tried to play, you know, bass and all that sort of stuff. But um, I sort of had the basics, you know. I've got the basics, but that's about it. But my, I think my strength was um, engineering, you know, and uh, and I learned that the hard way because back then you didn't have any – you didn't have YouTube, you didn't have any sort of books that you could just relate to and stuff and um, – and so I sort of, it was trial by fire for me. Uh, I was making coffee and cleaning the to toilets and stuff like that, you know. Um, yeah, I did that at Metropolis, yeah. mate. Well, you know, you know what it's like. And, uh, Absolutely. Uh, and it was hard yards, but it was fun. Um, and, and, you know, and it's a, it's a weird transition once you sort of do four years in a studio because I, I didn't see the city. For four years, I, all I saw was St Kilda, and um, and when I w it was t time for me to sort of spread my wings and fly away, um, I was a bit lost. I didn't know which way, I, what to do, you know. Uh, and then my career just went from up, 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 you know, and it just goes on and on and on, which I'm still, yep. you know, get, I've got to a point now where I'm a production manager at Bird's Basement, you know, and. Um, Yep. But that transition for you, I mean, in terms of what you, you're doing in the recording studio, so you, you primarily, uh, you're quite busy, I would imagine, you know, uh, your, your roster is uh, quite full up with, uh, do you produce acts and stuff like that, yeah? Yeah, well, it's mainly production, Pete, these days. And yes, um, up until COVID, um, the place uh, has always been really good. It's always been busy. Um, you know, I'm sort of leaning more, I'm doing a lot of country stuff at the moment. Um, I've had a bit of success in the country charts over the last four or five years. And um, so it's predominantly that, but I'm still doing music for theatre um, because, as you know, you know, the whole live band situation, even in theatres, there's no budget for it anymore. So all the stuff is pretty much pre-record. Um, which I'm lucky enough to be connected to a few theatre groups, major ones that I actually do um, pretty much all their theatre production mu music for and um, connected to a couple of small film companies. I just finished doing the post-production music for the Susie Quattro documentary. Um, so there's, there's kind of things like that that's happening, but, yes, predominantly these days it is production. It is. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Yeah. So, so when you were working at Metropolis... Um, 
How many years did you do there? Oh, look, I spent my school holidays there um, because my father had a travel agency across the road pretty much, well, it was on Clarendon Street, and my father knew Ernie because back in those days, all flights were booked through travel agents. So Ernie would be booking kind of the acts kind of coming in from Sydney and Adelaide and all those acts that used to record there. And, you know, my, I remember Ernie, uh, I remember my father, I said to my dad, oh, you know, I wouldn't mind actually, you know, getting into recording and production. And he said, oh, Ernie owns a studio down the road. I had no idea what it was. I don't actually think it was called Metropolis in those days. I think it was called Armstrong. something else. I can't... Re Maybe Armstrong's, yep. And, um, and he said, oh, look, I'll ask Ernie, see if you might be able to just go in there and sit in there and have a bit of a look. And I used to pretty much spend my school holidays there, um, rolling leads, making coffee, washing the floor. Um, and it was great experience. Every now and then I had the opportunity to sit in have a look, you know, go in and have a look at the, you know, the mic room, like the, the setups, you know, the mics and looked at the old consoles. And so I kind of liked it. I, I, I really had an interest for it from then. But then I started playing, when I left school, man, I, I pretty much started playing in a covers band and, um, you know, kind of made my money playing gigs and I kind of let it go, you know, for a while. Um, then hooked up with the Lee brothers, which I was with the Lee brothers since I was five years old, really. I'm like the fourth brother. So we'd always done stuff together. You know what I mean? Um, they went off, did the pseudo thing, and then we got back into it after pseudo. So, yeah. So pretty much like you, man, doing the same, same thing. Same thing as what you did. Um, with the Lee brothers... Um so you, you were in a band post Pseudo Echo with them. And Correct. I sort of remember that. I, I sort of vaguely remember you had you were doing something with them. Yep. What were you, what was your role in that? A, a guitar player in that band or No, I actually played played bass because James from Keys went to guitar. So the boys needed a bass player. Obviously wanted me involved in the band. So because I played guitar. I'd always missed around on bass anyway. And um, being that kind of hair rock band, it wasn't too uh, challenging, I guess, to be playing that stuff. So I ended up uh, being the bass player and backing vocalist in that band and, and voila, off we went on the journey. <laughs> so it was fun. We had a good time. We had a really good time. Yeah, it's interesting because like you, you were saying earlier about your band, the hair band, Timing is everything, isn't it? Because you, you think, oh, we've got some momentum here. Yeah. And, and then you go, you go, we have to make a record. So then by the time you get your shit together and, uh, and, and you went into the studio and did all that, all of a sudden there's a new thing coming up and it bypasses you. I mean, that's how quick it can be, right? Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that staggers me because I guess it I guess you have to strike while the iron's hot, you know, sometimes, you know. But it was a little bit impossible those days too, Peter, due to the technology we had. I mean, to record an album in those days, it would have taken two, three months, as you can appreciate. We don't have the tools we have today. We can bang out an album here in a week these days. If you really get down to it, head down us up. I don't have to tell you. But um when you're in a studio for three months, you're tracking, you're writing, you're producing, you're retaking vocals, you're rearranging stuff. By the time that record is released, you've already missed the bandwagon because something else came out. Man, when Nirvana came out, it was like, that's the end of hair band rock and roll. And, and it, it was, man. It was. It was. It was done. Yeah. We all disappeared, bro. It was all gone. You couldn't uh, alter it a bit? You couldn't put some ripped pants on and something like that? And uh... Mate, we couldn't do it because the songs were so popified and so lollipop to go with the image that it just wouldn't have worked. Nirvana were raw, man. They played raw. They were rock and roll. They were... You know, rah, 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 well, when, rah, I, when, rah. when I first heard them, I thought they were just an extension of, of Cheap Trick, early Cheap Trick. You know, that's what Good I Good analogy. Thought. Yeah. Good analogy, Peter. Yeah. 
Yes. You know, that that's what how I sort of heard them, you know. I just thought, oh, they're just another cheap trick, you know. Um, and then it just sort of extended from there on when the silver chair sort of did what they were doing right. and so on and so forth, you know. Yeah. But it went, Peter, from polished, polished hair rock to loose. Yeah. Loose pretty much throw the four-piece band in there and hit record, bro, and off yeah. we go. When you went to America, was that California? Did you go to L.A. or...? Yeah, we mainly stayed in California uh, because HK Management in those days were in California and we were trying to um, kind of tie in the record deal from Gotham within those days. Um, I think the company was BMG because I think they were affiliated anyway. So HK, HK Management had something to do with BMG. But again, because of the red tape of the visa we were on, we were very restricted as to what we could do and how we could do it. So we had planned to go back. We wrote a bunch of songs. We went into Gotham. I don't know if you remember Gotham out in uh, Warrendyke, Warrenwood. Yes, I, I sort of vaguely remember, yeah. So we went and spent like two months recording there. We actually lived there for a couple of months, writing and recording, because Ross had owned that studio with John Farnham. And by the time we recorded the stuff, produced it, mixed it down, grunge came in. Well, that was it. The hair band thing was all over. We pretty much missed the boat. So we were done and dusted. Um, we stayed in a covers band for a while. We sort of tried to recoup some funds playing in a covers band. It was fun. We had a great time, but it was kind of time for me to move on, mate. I just couldn't do that anymore. So this is where then I fell into production. So, yeah. So, you know, we, we both grew up in the western suburbs. In actual fact, we did. You grew up, what, in the same street, didn't you? Was it 6th Avenue? No, I was in 4th Avenue. 4th Avenue, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we went to primary school together. We went to high school together. Yes, we did. Yeah, man. I was a troubled. And I was a very troubled soul. You were a very nice boy. I flew under the radar. I don't know how much of a nice boy I was, but I flew under the radar always. <laughs> I would have when loved I to. Went, hey? When I went to school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no. But, I mean, you know, um, did you finish your year 12? No, mate. No, I was advised by well, my my father was advised by the uh, by the coordinators that I'd sort of go out and get myself a job. So, I thought, mate, that sounds good to me. Um, in those days, I was playing three gigs a week with my father's band, so I was making a decent living, probably making more than what the teachers were making at that time. So, I left on happy terms and uh, never looked back. I, I think I left at 16, but I, I, I ended up at Maribyrnong High because I was trying to do a music course at Maribyrnong High, which uh, they couldn't... Right. They didn't facilitate it because there weren't enough students in the class or something. I don't know. And then they said, oh, you have to go back into the main curriculum. And I said, look, I, I'm just going to go and get a job, you know. And back in those days, you could sort of, you know, we, I don't know, I didn't... I, I, I always wanted to be in the music business, but I just didn't have... It's a weird one, isn't it, Michael? Because I think when you're growing up, if you didn't, you know, you had the, I mean, you made friends with James and you could bounce off James, you know, with your music, you know. Absolutely. And unfortunately for me, the people I grew up with in the street, they weren't musically orientated, you know. So it was really hard to find someone in the area um, to bounce off off or try and learn, you know. Um, and I don't, it's a funny one, isn't it, how um, things can just work out. And Mr. Eastcott, we were talking about our primary school uh, music teacher. You know, I saw him, I'm pretty sure I saw him when I first started working at Woodstock in the mid-90s. And, and I think he was living down Ooh. in Woodstock Street uh, in uh, St Kilda. And he didn't, he didn't look any different. He still had the beard and the moustache. And, and I've gone... Is that Mr. Eastcott? You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, that's that's him because he walked past a couple of times, and then I never saw him ever again. You know, um, but yeah, did did you keep in contact with him, with him at all? Or um, my last contact was with, with him was when uh, James and I were actually doing a duo back in the oh god again early nineties, just after America, and we formed a duo just to recoup some money. 
And we played at a, a, a little bar that was, it was called the Down Under Bar and Bistro, just on the corner of Chapel Street and Turak Road. And believe it or not, who rolled up to the gig? Mr. Eastcott. So we were so happy to see him because we hadn't seen him since primary school. Um, and that was the last contact I had with Robert Eastcott. Would have been probably 92, 93. That's the last time I ever saw him. Yeah. Was but he, it was a beautiful soul. Beautiful soul. Did he... Um, was he still teaching at that stage or...? To be honest with you, I think we just spoke about the... Um, I think it was still teaching at Eastern Hill, but he wasn't doing primary school teaching anymore or high school teaching. It was just at Eastern Hill College of the Arts, I think it was called at that time. But obviously, that's going back a few years, Peter. We were all quite young in those days, so um, yeah. I'd imagine he would be retired now. I could imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, um, no, he was terrific. He, um, he, he formalised uh, a different way for kids who came from the western suburbs, you know, um, to tap into something, you know, uh, and that's what I like. I always used to love going to his music class. Um, it, it would, he yep. always used to make you feel wanted, I guess, you know. Um, well, he was terrific. He was, he was exciting because of the fact that he sort of, um, he kind of made us do things that we enjoyed. And he was the one who initially hooked James and I up at, you know, grade one we were. And, um, you know, kind of we, James and I kind of grew up together musically James's brothers both played. James's uh, middle brother, Vince, an amazing drummer. So we would sort of bounce things off each other. I would learn from Vince. But uh, Mr. Rescott was the man who actually put my, my father to actually get me into Billy Hyde's. And I was taught by a, an amazing teacher by the name of Peter Blick, who was kind of renowned in the whole drumming circuit. Um... You know, people like uh, Ron Sanderlands, which was teaching there in those days, all those kind of big guns guys. And uh, I became, I stayed there for about seven years and I ended up teaching there part-time. Um, I ended up getting a gig there, being a part-time teacher. So Mr. Eastcott kind of followed me all the way through that, Peter. And um, um, I remember the first gig um, he took me to was with the Melbourne Show Band. And he said, look, you know, we're taking a class down there of musicians and he said, you might have the opportunity to play with the Melbourne Show Band. So this was all set up at the Melbourne Town Hall for some Moomba festival. Ron Sanderlands was the drummer then, and I hadn't met Ron. And Ron said, oh, would you like to come up and play a song with the show band? And he said, but you'll have to read music. And I said, man, music is all golf clubs to me, man. I can't read music. And he said, well, what do you mean? He goes, you can play. He goes, you can't read. And I said, no, I can't actually read music. So... Hence in saying that, that's when I kind of started the whole, I guess, journey with Billy Hydes and and that was it for me. And then I sat on drums for many, many years. I played for many years in bands and made a decent living out of it. And up until the time where the boys wanted me to play bass in in the uh, original band uh, the, that we had, that we went to LA, LA with, and I never played drums again. <laughs> so. that, it's amazing because I always think of you, I mean, you're very multi-talented because I always think of you as a drummer, but you, you, you don't sort of play the drums that much anymore. No, I still play in a studio. I still, you know, practice. Um, I'll do a gig here and there every now and then because um, I've still got my chops up. But I'm a front man now and have been a front man in a covers band, um, you know, for many, many years now, so... I'm, I'm loving that. I'm sort of doing what I want to do now. So it's great. Yeah, that's great, man. And you, yeah. you, you showed me that great picture of you and James uh, going to the Kiss concert. <laughs> yeah. Show me that picture again, mate. I want to see that picture. That's a terrific picture. Okay, man. This was 1980. Yeah. And, and it was the first international concert that James and I ever, ever went to and we were dressed, dressed like um, yeah. Peter Chris. Yeah, well, I was dressed to kill and James was in the Ace Freely kind of normal kind of thing that was going on. And that's how we went to the damn concert. And, you know, and actually James did that for me for my 50th birthday. He said, oh, I've got something special. 
I'd forgotten about that photo and amongst all the other gifts that he gave me for my 50th, but he gave me this and this hangs in my studio and um, it was really good memories, Peter. We Man, there wasn't anything we didn't do together. He was my best man at my wedding, so... And we still kind of hang till today, so he's, he's a very dear friend. And, and, and I'm the fourth brother. Yeah, and what does James do with himself these days? Look, those boys are still in production, still writing. They've got a record company called Cultiv Cultivator Records. He's got a beautiful studio that he's set up in Williamstown. Um, so the boys are still at it, and every now and then we'll bounce something off each other and kind of do a few things together. So... The boys are still very active, and um, but I guess we catch we, we we sort of more catch up on a personal level these days than what we do anything work related because I'm kind of on the other side of production. You know what I mean? I don't really do the writing. I don't really I don't have a record label. I'm sort of more into the engineering, production, mixing side of things. You know what I mean? I want to. Know, how did you get to the uh, Waverley? Did you catch? You obviously caught a train, right? No, no, because uh, actually James's father was the one who drove us down there. Believe it or not, and back in those right. days, man, to drive to Waverley, oh, it was a million miles away. Man, you had to take a packed lunch, bro. Um, yeah, and get yeah. there. And gosh, I, I do recall that we got there around about ten thirty in the morning. And James's father and mother had waited for us until the gates opened. Um, so we were just a couple of kids, mate, just kind of waiting with the parents. And as soon as the gates opened, well, we sort of stood back because it was a bit of a rush. And then we kind of went in there and there was no mobile phones in those days because we couldn't call the parents, you know, say and say, oh, listen, we're in the venue, um, you know, we're okay. I mean, but... And then we ended up waiting outside the same place that they dropped us off. And I, re I recall waiting about an hour and a half after the gig and we were shitting ourselves because we was kind of like one of the last ones left there and we couldn't find James's dad. So, man, it was like... Because there was not... As you, as you can appreciate, Peter, when we were kids, there was none of this technology. No, no. So... And that's how we got to the gig, bro. That's how we got there. So, where, where um, were, were you um, on the ground? Were you on the ground, or you were in the stands? No, we were actually the first um, tier. So it was, if you can appreciate the ground. So where the grandstand first started on the bottom tier, we had those tickets right opposite the stage. So it was a bloody perfect view. We had binoculars, but it was a perfect view. And I remember, man, just the buzz of it all. I mean, they were probably really shit, but we thought they were the best thing since sliced bread. And but, just but to see your Do you remember idols, what the man, sound was, was like, like? I couldn't recall, man, honestly. I couldn't recall. We were just so taken by the fact that we were at a Kiss concert. And what a damn concert to start off your kind of concert years. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I Major said. Major event. Like I said, I, I pleaded with my father, you know, to let me go, but uh, he said, you can kiss my ass and stay home, you know. <laughs> and um, Well, <laughs> but, uh, well the, the funny thing was, Peter, Eric Carr did that tour. Eric Carr? Yeah, because okay. Peter Chris had left. But I always had in my mind... Oh, that's right, he did, he did, yeah. And I, I made a bet with James, and we don't stop talking about this. The reason why I dressed up like Dressed to Kill was because in my heart, I actually thought that Peter Chris would do the gig. Man, we were kids, so it's like, oh, no, no, he's got he's yeah. to do the gig. He's like, got to do it. He's on he's Shandy. Yeah. He's on Sure No Something. He's on I Was Made For Loving You. <laughs> like, he's, like that's, yeah. he didn't even play drums on any of those tracks, obviously, which I kind of knew later on, but I thought this guy was a gun. I had a drum kit like that. My father bought me a drum kit like that, and I still have it. So in my brain, I thought, nah, nah, Peter's coming, Peter's coming. And when I saw Eric Carr on the stage, it was like, fuck, really? <laughs> but, you know, it was great. It was great. Oh, it would have been exciting, man. I mean, there were so many. I mean, that, how many people would have been attending that? that? There would have been heaps of kids, right? Well, I do recall half of the arena being closed because of the staging. 
So there would have been probably three quarters of the ground and probably about two thirds of the diameter, if you can appreciate, of the stadium. So I would say there would have been maybe 20,000, 25,000, because, well, we actually thought, you know, um, uh, uh, God, I can't even remember what it was called. Waverley was quite, we actually thought it was a big ground in those days, but nowhere near the size of the G nor Eddie had. So maybe 20, 25,000, but man, there was kids and people everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it um, was. It, I mean, it was Kiss the Mania, wasn't it? I mean, everywhere you went, it was just Kiss, wasn't it? Do you remember? Like it was, mate. They were selling, make Kiss dolls in Target and Kiss dolls in bloody Kmart, and you'd go down the city, and you know every record shop had Kiss posters, Kiss this, Kiss that. It was like, it was crazy, bro. You know, it was a. It was a time in our life, I think, where um, we were actually mesmerised by these heroes. These guys were actually heroes. Yeah, totally. I, I never really, you know, you sort of, I liked the music. You know, I didn't like their, I, I didn't really take, I mean, I, I didn't get into their makeup and all of that. That was sort of secondary for me. But yeah, I liked the music, you know, and I got introduced to the music by couple of guys down the street who were about five or six years older than me and they were and they brought what was the live album kiss alive was it kiss alive there was kiss alive there was actually yeah. kiss alive one and kiss alive two yeah they they had those and when i heard one of the songs off kiss alive i've just i think it was De, was it detroit 64 or something they would have opened with detroit rock city they yeah, always opened that's with right. that track yeah um I, you know, the sound, because we really weren't exposed to sounds like that. It was a new thing, you know, and uh, that's what took me, you know, was the sound of it. And then I was just, and then I brought Dynasty and I was like, I was converted, you know, I was just like, these these guys are incredible, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, sorry. I, I think it was the structure of it all too, Peter. We weren't used to hearing rock and roll structured in those days. Because um, they were kind of like in those days, I remember pe people used to call them like a, a heavy metal band. Well, it wasn't heavy metal. It was rock, it was pop with the glam, but it was actually structured. And I think that's what introduced me to the structure of how pop should actually sound in that environment. I mean, the hooks, uh, you know, the man, you know, I mean, it's like I, incredible. I, I mean, um, I Was Made For Loving You is a disco song, you know. If you told me it was a disco song in 1980, I know. Peter. You, you'd go, no way, right? I would have said to you, bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> I know, give this, me is, this is not staying alive, man. This is not staying alive by the Bee Gees. But it's a disco song. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is. Right? I mean, but it, well, how clever were they? You know, that, in terms of their marketing and all that sort of stuff, they were just beyond their years, you know, incredible. In incredible marketing, Peter. And, um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, we talk about people like Alice Cooper that started the whole makeup thing. Bowie did it. I mean, we all know that they did it. But I think Kiss actually took the pop side of it and really popified it because it was totally popified bro all the way all the way you know what i mean and i think that's what we were suckers for mate we we just fell into it headline you know headline and sinker i mean yeah. i mean countdown was full of kiss yes it was it was kiss 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 that's all it was uh, man until xanadu came came up yeah, absolutely. And that it, was another biggie. <laughs> you know, and but yeah. it, but it's amazing because I saw we saw the um, the rise of Kiss, and then we saw the the decay of Kiss. You know, it, it was quite staggering when when you think about it how big they were, and then by the what mid to late eighties they had descended into the wilderness sort of thing. I mean, they were still doing yes. big stadium tours and stuff, but in terms of their promotional 
they weren't like the Rolling Stones where they had a had a uh, market. That's right. You know, it was a bit different, but it, it was amazing. Look, well, what happened was, I think, Peter, is that because us guys, well, people like my vintage, had evolved from that, um, the makeup, like for me, the worst album they ever did was an album called The Elder. And it was kind of kiss and makeup, trying to change, trying to move on with the times, but it didn't work. Because for me, the look, the sound, just didn't go hand in hand. Um, I think they kind of had already missed the boat. But then when the rock glam came in, you know, your Poisons, your Bon Jovis, and they took the makeup off and then went into that stadium kind of God gave rock and roll to you and all that kind of stuff, it sort of fit in with that Bon Jovi, but that Bon Jovi kind of era, but then faded off really quickly again. Because I believe they didn't have that ingredient anymore what are you working on at the moment because we've just come out of covert and uh were you working throughout that period of time i was doing some stuff for fox news during the elections peter via zoom so uh i was just doing some work for hire stuff some doof doof boom boom music during the kind of you know interviews if you like so i was lucky enough i'd met jim pozzola back in the 90s and um jim knew that the studio was shut down and i couldn't have anybody in here and he kind of threw this curveball at me and said, look, I know it's not what you normally do, but, you know, if you're not doing anything, would you be interested? So I said, yeah, man, well, I'm not doing much. Let's give this a crack. So I wasn't open to the public, but I was doing a lot of Zoom stuff with Jim. Um, he's based in um, San Francisco. So we were just bouncing stuff over for Fox News during the uh, American elections. Um, but that's all I was doing. But I had a lot of stuff that was unfinished post-COVID. Um, so I'm kind of just picking up now as to where I left off. So, And trying to go back, Pete, and get a vibe on what you were doing eight months ago, you can appreciate, man. It's like, how do I ride this bike again? <laughs> so, you know, because um, you're trying to, you're trying to kind of rekindle the vibe, if you like. Um, of what you were on eight months ago, you know what I mean? So so we're slowly getting back into it. So thank the uh, universe that things are picked up again. Yeah, so, totally, yeah. mate. Yeah, we're still in lock. We're, we're still yeah. shut down. We won't be opening until next year sometime. So it, of course. it's a bit of a drag, you of know, course. in terms of live stuff, you know. But there's some venues opening up at the moment, which is great. Yeah, well, I just got back into the live thing last Friday night. You know, I've got a couple of regular gigs that I do and it was good to get back and bang out some tunes, you know what I mean? And, and just meet people again, see your regulars that come and see you and, you know, have a... Well, I didn't really have that many beers because I think I would have crawled home, but, um, you know, it was just good to see people out kind of living again, Peter. And you'll understand when you're back into it again, you'll say, yep, Zamet was actually right. It was actually good to get out. I kind of kept away from the live stream thing, Peter, because um, there were, one, there was a lot of people doing it, and two, um, you know, we were going to do a band live stream thing, but I just feel I've always pre performed in front of an audience, and as you know, there is nothing like getting that reaction from those who come and see you, and I just kind of wasn't really feeling it, so... I kind of, for me, I thought, well, there's one way to kind of keep in with my audience that I have. So I decided to do like a series of covers that I grew up listening to and just um, record them, produce them and just do a, a small video, small live video of them and just pop them on Facebook. Um, because that way I didn't have to interact with the camera. I didn't have to pretend I was talking to people. It was just like, bang, three and a half minute track, pop it on and off we go. Um, so what I'm planning on doing is releasing that CD. It's just a cover CD, releasing the video, doing a launch, and then giving it all to Autism Advisory Service, which I kind of do a bit of charity work for and have been for the last three or four years. So hasn't cost me anything to produce. If I can give it to somebody who I can help, man, if it helps one person, I've done my job, mate. So I'm happy with that. 
So what, what desk are you running yep. at your studio? Well, believe it or not, I bought this desk from um, 3AW about 12 years ago, and it's an old TX Series 15 Japanese desk, which is modelled on the Triton... Uh, don't know the series of it, but it was modelled on the Triton... Made in 1974. This console's actually made in 76. And it was one of three three prototypes that were made. They did a short run of them and there was only 150 consoles made like this. But I've got one of the prototypes that AW was using back in the mid-70s. So I was lucky enough to buy it. It was in storage for about 15 years. And my good friend Zoran told me about it. It was the TIAC... Um, one of the TIAC representatives, and he used to be the service manager. And uh, I was looking for an old console, and he said, Michael, if there's one console you need to buy, have a look at this one. And it was in perfect condition, Peter. Um, all recapped, all redone, just sitting in storage in a road case. And I thought, man, if I don't buy this, I ain't going to buy anything. So, And it was, it's a, it's a 24 channel? 24 channel, 8 bus, although I don't really mix on it. I just use the preamp stage of it these days. I use it more as a, a busing console, if you like, these days, because, as you know, everything's kind of in the box here. Yeah? Um, and uh, I'm still using uh, the old cube, well, not the old Cubase, but I'm still using Cubase, although I've, I've got a tool set up, but, man, you can't teach an old dog new tricks here. Yeah? So, um, but, you know, you know what it's like, all the universal plugins and all that stuff, so we... I do everything virtually in the box, and I just use it as a bussing console these days. So, yeah. But if I'm recording drums or if I'm recording a live band, you know, I will always go through the console. Um, you know what I mean? Just to use the pre's of it, because the pre's are pristine. Such yeah. beautiful preamp stages. And is that... Yeah. So, was that your first console that you brought, or you had another console prior to No. That? I had a 48, well, it was an M24, but it was a 48 channel that I had because I bought the extension. So I bought that brand new from Tascam. God, I remember that cost me well over 30K. And I had a two inch 24 track uh, tape machine sitting in the corner back in those days, hooked up to a Simpty machine that was running through my old, uh, gosh, the old Atari 1040 STEs. And that was running all my MIDI, and that would run my 24-track audio going through my 48-channel bloody M24, I think it was called. I can't even remember. And I've still got that console. It's actually in storage because um, I, don't, I don't get rid of anything. I never, ever sell anything. You're a hoarder. Um, I am, bro. I've still got my old 688. I've got two DA. I've got a DA38, a DA88 when we went to... I don't know if you remember the old, that was either the ADATs or it was either the, the Tascam DA88s and 38s. So I've got a 38 and an 88 still sitting there, probably worth 20 bucks these days. I've got about three DAT machines sitting around. I've got bloody all sorts of stuff, mate. I don't get rid of a thing. So probably never use it again, but hey, you know, hey, it's you mine. Never, you you look, you never know with that stuff because you might yeah. have something archived and you go, I want to rehash something. You know, you might go back into your archival and go, oh, I can actually transfer it because I've got that machine to do it with. Yeah. It makes it, it, makes it hard if you don't have that machine, you know. Getting back to uh, when we were growing up, mate, I, I just want to touch on some stuff there because we never used to see each other that much when we were growing up. Uh, I, You know, because I think... Um, were, we, were you younger than me by a year or so? Or? Yeah, I was a year younger than you, Peter, but um, uh, I think, uh, again, as you touched on it, I was kind of a little bit more drawn towards the musical side of things. Um, and, and, you know, although we were always friends at school, um, but everyone had their little kind of niche, if you can appreciate that, um, and then I remember when we went to high school, I think you started off at Altona North Tech. And I was always at Altona North High School. Um, but 
if you can appreciate, I didn't really go to school that often because what we would do is we would go in the morning, go to homeroom, mark off our names, and then go and hang out at James's place and play Bloomin' Music all day. Why? Because we could do that in those days. You know, um, and then the teachers loved us because we were always kind of, you know, we got along with everyone. We never made trouble. So I was like, okay, where are the boys? Uh, yeah, they're at James's place. Let's just mark them as present. So again, that's probably why we didn't quite connect that well because I wasn't really there most of the time in high school. Yeah, yeah. So... That's amazing because I never knew that. So that's the, they're the things that skip by you and you don't know. <laughs> yeah, man. You're a sly dog. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit, mate. I was a little bit, yes. Yeah, no, that's great. That's terrific, mate. I would have loved to have done that. Um, that would have been, you know, down my, down my alley for sure if I had have, uh, known that was happening. But I think you came and had a blow with us one time at James's place. No. I think you did. I think by memory you came down because you were doing some vocals and I'm going back, God, we would have been about maybe 14 years old, Peter. Okay. And we were going to get a band together and I, I do recall you coming to James's place. Okay. I do recall that. I think, I think, I think you're, you're shaking my memory. I think you might be right. Because yeah. I worked with the uh, Dandy Warhols producer back in, I was only in my second year as an as a engine, audio you know, assistant. Wow. And uh, he um, had just finished, yeah, the first Dandy Warhols album. And he... Sure. He was an amazing engineer, Michael. I mean, he showed me stuff that... And I had worked with some really great engineers from Melbourne and England, but he was on another... You know, because he worked for Capitol Records, basically. Sure. And... Um, yeah, what he was doing with compression and uh, how he could slice tape and do all this sort of stuff, and the way and his drum sounds were just incredible, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he was very influential for me because he showed me music that um, he, he he showed me music that I wasn't privy to, and uh, I was really appreciative of his time and, and what he was able to show me in that short period that I worked with him. You know, he was terrific. Yeah, it's kind of another another dynamic, isn't it? It's another kind of way. And when, when, when Nirvana came out, we were sort of scratching our heads going, well, where do we go from here? Yeah. Take out just the, like... Take out the synthesizers and just go, you know, guitar, drums, bass, vocals. It was too late, Peter. It was way too late. But we got some great demos out of it. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Do you, but, do, do, yeah. you, do you still have the multi reels for that, or we have the James has got the multi reels, but I've got the DAT somewhere, um, which probably a shed by now. But I've got some stuff still on hard drive that we did because um, I managed to find a couple of old SA cassettes um, that we used to bounce on. So yeah, I oh, know it's crazy, it's, right? It's uh, cra crazy stuff. Absolutely. All right, brother. Well, I want to I want to thank you for your time. Um, it's been it's 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 great. Thank you. It's great talking with you and catching up. Uh, you know, I hope I didn't break your balls too much. <laughs> no, bro. It was so good. I was yeah. so looking forward to this, Peter. Yeah. Just to say good day, and you know, we're from the same blooming background, and yeah. we've both done the hard yarns, and yeah, and we're survivors, brother. We're that's survivors. It. Well, that's it. That's what we are. All right, take care. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Peter. All the best, mate, okay? Yeah, likewise. Papa put a voodoo on me. You must have cast a spell.